All right, it is seven o'clock, and that means it is time to do some full stacking. So I'm glad you all are here. Um, it is a wonderful Thursday night here in Carlsbad, and hope it's fine where you are. Um, glad you're here. We have a kind of a fun night tonight uh, in the, um, I guess, in the tradition of uh, continuing from last month where we're trying new things out. This, this month we have our first guest speaker. And we're both learning this software, so we're trying to figure it out, and hopefully it'll be uh, at least viewable um, by all of you. Again, like last time, we're going to have um, some conversation after the, the stream, so uh, feel free to join up on our Slack. Uh, I've got the address here, um, and I can post it in the, uh, the comment section here as well once Richard gets going. Um, also, uh, at the end, we'll have, um, after Richard's talk, we'll have some uh, open time. Um, and of course, in the open time, it's mostly just gonna be comments. So feel free to jump in the comments. Um, I can see your comments, and um, so I can respond to them if you need to. Uh, get a hold of me, or have any announcements that you want to provide, like if you're hiring or if you're looking for work. Uh, if you have any, uh, if you want any help on any side projects or anything like that, um, we'll have a time for that at the end. So, um, with that being said, let me go ahead and bring Richard in here. And uh, he is live from his house. Let's see if how we do this. Ah, there we go. Hey, -o. hey, it's Richard. Hey, Richard, how you doing tonight? Not bad. How are you, Gio? Pretty good. Pretty good. I I, I like the uh, the planning center studio here. Um, and like last time, I still can't figure out how to turn this lamp on. I've got all these fancy lights around me. Um, you know, got the shiny head and everything going, but I still can't figure out how to turn that lamp on. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I've got this fancy setup right here where I just <laughs> <laughs> doesn't seem to work at all. <laughs> That's too bad. Um, all right. So uh, tonight you are going to be talking about uh, drawing, right? This is the art class. <clears throat> yep. Uh, everybody needs scotch tape, uh, scissors, preferably the kind with the, like the little triangle edges and, yeah, and oh, yeah. felt. Yes. We're doing software software diagrams for toddlers. <laughs> yep. Nice. Project night here at Full yeah. Stack. Uh, no, last month, if you were able to join us, and if you weren't, you can go back and watch the talk. Um, we actually didn't do a talk. We watched the talk together and then discussed it afterwards. Uh, but we went through a talk which talked about how, as developers today, we've kind of forgotten some of the things that developers in the 90s knew um, or did, practiced. And so one of the things that... Um, a few of us latched on to was uh, drawing more and um, specifically like drawing diagrams uh, of systems, architecture, um, you know, response cycles, things like that. And uh, Richard mentioned that his company does a lot of those. And um, so I asked him if he wouldn't mind uh, coming on tonight and providing a little overview of what kind of diagrams he uses and, and how he uses those. Um, Cause it sounds pretty cool. Um, and Honestly, we have a book club at Planning Center, which is where I work. And right now we're going through the book Pragmatic Programmer, the Pragmatic Programmer. And it's an old book. Um, probably, I don't remember when the first edition was, but it, it reads kind of like it may have been in the 90s. Although it's on the third edition now. They just released the third edition. Uh, so it has modern languages like Elixir and Ruby and JavaScript in there. Um, but one of the things they talk about is... Um, well, I guess one of the reasons I like it is because it kind of goes through some of the things, some of the, the, the basic things that would have fit into a talk that we like, like a talk we, w we watched last time um, that developers used to know that we kind of don't do as much. And so with last month's talk and the book and now tonight's Richard, Richard's uh, presentation, I'm excited because it, they all kind of seem to fit together, at least for me and other people who have read The Pragmatic Programmer. Um, and I was talking with Richard a little bit before. Richard, you were saying that uh, you've worked with some older guys who seem to know what was going on. Yes. Uh, I, I used to work in Virginia um, in the defense contracting sector. And the resident knowledge there for systems that goes back years is crazy. And mm -hmm. these guys, they you got to remember that like this idea that you can just jump in and code is kind of a new invention, right? Like for the last 30 years, these guys had to plan everything ahead of time, right? Some of these guys, they were doing punch cards. And so they were like programming like on paper and then they'd have to bring it over. And I think that like cognitive kind of process really helped them design systems with, before they actually jumped in. So yeah, it's really good technique. Yeah, that's cool. I, it reminds me of like um, my favorite movie is War Games. And in there, they're mm -hmm. going through some source code trying to figure out how 
you know, Lightman broke in. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Uh, you're nodding your head like you have, but they're going yeah. through the source code trying to figure out how he found this back door. And the source code is literally like this binder that they printed yeah. out. It's not like they just pulled up Vim or VS Code. It's like they had the, they had to print out the source code so they could z see it all. And they're like going through with a pencil and like when he closes it, he puts a ruler in it to keep his place. Um, that's that's yeah. real, man. They had, did have to do it on paper and it just wasn't as easy as we have it now. Absolutely. So with that being said, like you, you've got um, a little bit of a throwback in that you guys still use drawings and in my mind that feels more back in line with those eight those times where you had to print everything out and you had you know we have whiteboards and stuff now which is mm -hmm. i get could be similar when you draw things out by hand mm -hmm. um uh but it's much different than you know having it on paper <laughs> having to go yeah. to college, things like that yeah and I, and i hope tonight you get a kind of a modern like refreshing take on diagramming because we we diagram a lot, but we're not zealots about it, right? And that's kind of what the talk is about: is that you know you want to go into this with a an open mind, but you also want to realize that your your time is a resource, and there's an opportunity cost to doing diagrams. So you really do diagrams when it's necessary. You don't do it just for the sake of diagram. And and you'll get a it's pretty clear in the presentation. You'll probably think I hate diagrams at the end, but I really don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'll see. Um, I'm, I'm just recommending things that work for us and it, they probably will work for you as well. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. so I just realized that the link I have on the screen for the Slack group is actually expired. So, um, while Richard starts his talk, I'll go generate a new one of those links and uh, put it up for us and put it in the, in the comments yeah. for everyone. Um, and if you're watching this on a replay, I don't know how long that link is going to, uh, last. So, uh, if you need that link, you can email us at talks at fullstacktalks.com. And, uh, and we'll get that. Um, all right, Richard, are you ready? I am ready to go. All right, I'm gonna give it to you. Uh, take it away, buddy. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, hey, good evening. Thank you for attending this. I know you could be doing a million things right now and just taking the time to, uh, to watch me talk and watch me gab at you is pretty special. So thank you. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about practical software diagrams for busy engineers. We're all busy engineers. None of us have time to really like spend a bunch of time architecting and, and making really large, rigid architectural specs. Um, we got to write code and we got to deliver software. And so I hope what you can take away from this talk tonight is some kind of some tips and some help that will allow you to diagram, but also preserve your time. All right. So purpose of today is to talk about first the purpose of diagrams. Like why do we even do it in the first place? Um, and then I'm gonna talk um, very specifically about practical diagramming and I'm gonna show um, some actual diagrams that we use and kind of methodology and how they're used. And then I'm going to wrap up with recommendations for using diagrams. So I'm gonna show you the diagrams. Um, I don't actually use all the diagrams that I'm gonna present, but I will give you some recommendations on when they should get used. So what makes me so good at diagrams? Well, um, I've got a lot of experience writing software and uh, a lot of experience trying to communicate requirements and ideas to other engineers. And that's really where diagrams come into play. They're not really for you. They're not really for historical record. They're there for you to communicate what you're trying to build. I've also led a bunch of teams, teams of engineers and building microservices where diagrams are particularly important. Um, I've worked in a lot of industries. Um, a lot of industries with heavily regimented requirements, um, like the government. And in the government, you will find modeling everywhere. In fact, they don't write software unless it's modeled. And it's actually kind of crazy. And finally, I've been told by people who are not my mom that I'm good at it, all right? So um, I think I have some credibility here. Uh, I guess at the end of the night, you can tell me whether I was right or not. So start. Why am I diagramming? Let's talk about the purpose of diagrams. I want to start with diagrams kind of suck, right? At the core, they take a lot of time to make. They go stale incredibly fast, which means that there are a lot of maintenance if you're trying to keep diagrams current. They may not be immediately understood by your audience. Um, this is very common if you're 
um, working in a particular diagramming methodology that is like for software engineers, and then you're presenting it to product. And then they're also really good targets for bike shedding. Bike shedding is like this, uh, this thing that happens when people typically of less technical skill spend a lot of time and energy discussing like trivial aspects of something, right? Like the, the original term comes from, I think like uh, a bike shed in Stanford and people, this guy presented the, the plans for it and people argued about the color. So that's kind of where the, the term comes from. So diagrams kind of suck, but they can be purposeful. And their three essential purposes are to communicate intent, right? They're there to basically answer the question, what are we trying to build? Or if you're diagramming after the fact, what did we build? They also document a major line of development. And this is very common for us. We typically diagram only at the beginning of a major feature. So we say, here's what we're doing. It's not the typical way that we implement something. And this is kind of what it looks like. And the final piece is to discover your software domain, so to find redundancies, uh, problems in your architecture, uncertainties, and all of this without having to write code first. Now, I will say that the discovery portion is not, in, is, is not inherent in the diagram itself, but more the process of creating the diagram. It's the conceptualization of the software and the realization that certain interplays are happening, and you get to that without having to actually write code. And finally, this is kind of takeaway with like with all diagrams that you're going to see today. There are guiding principles for diagramming, and those are: their diagrams need to be purposeful. They need to, to communicate something, right? So you have to add, you have to answer the question: What am I trying to communicate? Diagrams should be concise. Does it communicate one thing and one thing only? This is that kind of single responsibility principle. Or have you muddled the diagram with a bunch of extra detail? that basically gets the purpose lost. Um, contextual, who is your audience, right? Because depending on who your audience is, you can kind of shift into different like sim uh, symbolism or symbologies, right? Like you can uh, use a uh, highly technical like uh, symbolism for like an architecture diagram when you're dealing with engineers. But if you're dealing with like product, or you're dealing with people that don't understand that, you're gonna have to like actually kind of uh, turn that diagram into something that's understandable by the layman. And finally, is it clear? Does the diagram need interpretation or does it stand on its own? Meaning that like, can someone just pick up your diagram, read it and understand what you're trying to, to communicate or do they need someone to shepherd you uh, or shepherd them through that, that diagram? And that's important because you always want it to stand on its own. Okay, so that was kind of like my, my preachy, like why are we diagramming? So let's actually talk about practical engineering diagrams and how to use them. Okay, this is really important because I think a lot of people get this wrong. Diagrams represent a specific level of detail of a system, right? They don't, mul they, they don't merge multiple levels. That's incredibly important. So like on the right, you see a network layout diagram, and then you also see a, an entity relationship diagram, right? Two different types of diagrams you would not merge both of those into the same same view. It makes sense, right? You don't wanna show, oh, here's a database model and then here's the services that communicate to that model. It, it doesn't make sense. So they always describe a specific level. And there are many levels in which you can conceptualize software, right? You have the overall system and where it fits in the environment. You could talk about the network or the compute infrastructure in which it sits in. You can describe service interactions or even data representation, like this is the layout of the database and what it looks like. So because there are so many things to visualize, people have come up with modeling systems. These are formal systems for documenting um, architecture or documenting like pieces of that architecture. And probably the most famous uh, two that you will deal with are BPMN, which is for business processes, and UML, and, and everybody dreads UML, but UML is actually not that bad. Um, but these are like frameworks that people have come up with, which have like tens of diagrams that you can use to kind of describe aspects of your system. There are also many independent diagrams. So there are, there are different diagrams that people have independently come up with. They may even have a methodology and a standard on how to use that diagram, but 
the point here is that you don't have to just go and reach for UML and, and find the most appropriate UML diagram to fit your need. You can go on the web and you can find different diagrams. You can invent your own diagram. The key point here is that your goal is to communicate something to the, the end user that's receiving that diagram and viewing it. And if that takes you making up your own diagram to do it, that's fine. As long as it's clear, concise, purposeful, et cetera. In addition to the individual diagrams, you will rarely, you'll rarely document a system with a single diagram. It doesn't make any sense, right? Like if you're going to say, hey, we're building the system and there's these services and then there are these different things that these services do or interact with, you're not gonna show that on one diagram. You're gonna have to have a collection of diagrams. And because of that, there are different ways for laying out those diagrams. And over the years, there have become standards on how you do that. And so we call these architecture frameworks, and they're really not like actual like software architecture. They're, they're actual like methodologies. So you have the first three that I list um, on the right are enterprise kind of like IBM-esque like architectures. TOGAF, DODAF, which is like the DOD's version, which is crazy. It has something like 50 different types of diagrams that we, you would use. IAP, um, which is like kind of more popular in Europe. And then finally, something I'm going to talk about later, the C4 model. So these, these are like frameworks for telling you what kinds of diagrams you should use when you try to describe like a unit of work that you're going to do. So how do I know what and how to diagram, right? We have many, many different like types of things that we want to diagram, right? Like we have networks, service, state machines, service interactions. There's a lot of pieces to it. When describing your system, you want to obviously use the set of diagrams, like I mentioned before. Each diagram is gonna describe a level of that system, right? So you can imagine that you're gonna have multiple levels and you're gonna have diagrams for each level. You're gonna to wanna to choose diagrams that explain complicated but not obvious aspects of the system. Now, there's no point in diagramming well understood things. For instance, you don't want to create like lines to the internet to show that a user's browser is communicating through a cloud internet to your, you know, your web server. That doesn't make any sense. Same thing with like a three tier architecture. If you have a browser, a web server and a database, right? And they communicate in that standard three tier pattern, it doesn't make sense to diagram it. So like I said, you're gonna find those non-obvious aspects of your system and that's what you're gonna focus your diagramming effort. Okay, so to start, instead of describing individual diagrams, I'm gonna start with a methodology, right? Like a family of diagrams or a collection of diagrams and that will help you know what kinds of diagrams you should use and how you should organize it and lay it out. So the um, particular system I wanna describe is something called C4. C4 was invented by Simon Brown. He's this really talented uh, speaker, software engineer, and consultant. Um, and he's, uh, he invented this system and he's been evangelizing it for a couple of years now. The C4 system is very simple. It, has, it, it considers four levels of architecture. The, the system context, or context, because he, he doesn't want it to be S, you know, C3, he wants it to be C4. So context, container, component and code. And these four levels describe aspects of the level of your software. So the way that he likes to, I don't know if it's getting clipped by this little uh, blue comment here. Um, the way that he likes to talk about the C4 system is imagine your architecture is Google Maps, right? You want to start at like a really high level. So imagine a map of Europe. That's your first level. So this is like, this is where we are in the world. And then you're gonna drill down and maybe go to a country level. And in this case, he's showing the English channel. And so this might be your second level. And then third level, he drills down to the Isle of Man, which happens to be where he's from. So here you get this kind of like, this overview of the Isle of Man. And then finally you drill down into a bike path, right? And that's like your level four, which is code. Uh, oh. So to describe these, uh, these levels more specifically, there's the first diagram or the first level, 
that Simon has developed called the system context. This is a diagram that provides a starting point for showing how the software system fits in the world around you, right? And so in his example, he's got his customer, which is like a banking customer, and he shows that they interact with the banking system and the banking system interacts with an email system, which might interact with a mainframe that does all the batch analytical processing. Typically, this is not like super important for us developers, but it might be helpful for people to understand overall your system, like outside of your company. Then he drills down into what's called the container diagram. And this tends to be like services, right? So here's the web server. Here's the, the spa, the single page application, a mobile app, API layer, databases, et cetera. So this is this diagram is also kind of called a service layout. So it's showing you a, a top-down view of your services. These are independent processes running in your architecture. Um, but he refers to it as a container. And then you have the component level. And component level is components inside a process, right? And this is one of the weird levels where you might show multiple processes but have components within those processes like interoperating. And that is like one of the kind of the strange aspects of microservices where you kind of get this little blend of another level. But generally, it's there to kind of demonstrate like in like a microservice architecture or like a B2B architecture, like you're going to have components of different systems interoperating. And what does that look like? So this is a zoom down level of components within a process. And finally, the code level. And the code level could be like a UML class diagram and entity relationship diagram. This is to show you aspects of actual code and data model. So it's really low level. So as a side note, one thing I want to point out that I really love about the C4 framework is the notation that Simon has developed. So um, what you'll see here is uh, uh, there are a lot of like notation systems, like in UML, they have different notation systems. This one I like because it's very succinct. He'll typically use like a name, like a, a common name to describe something. Like this is the accounting service. And then under it, he'll have little brackets and he'll be like, okay, the accounting service is a software implemented on a J2EE like application server, right? So he'll put like the technology behind it. And then if that's not obvious, he'll write a description for someone. Like, it, you know, the accounting service um, handles uh, the tracking of user accounts in the banking system. And then another thing he does with his diagrams is he adds always like a title on his diagram and then he'll write a description and then he'll put like a last modified and like here you see like a git hash, right? I'm not advocating that you do like a git hash, um, but like these little things are helpful because if you're trying to preserve like the historical context of when this diagram was written and what it's about, like these little pieces of notation are extremely helpful. So Simon uh, talks about in C4 having these four different levels, right? The, the context, the container, component, and code. But in addition to that, um, he says that you need to supplement those like diagrams because they're not going to capture everything. And in particular, those diagrams are fairly static. They show the layout of the system, right? Like here are components interoperating or here are like uh, services and generally what they do when they interact. But it doesn't show like a sequence of events. It doesn't show like the, the data model. It doesn't show a state machine and how it changes over time and what are the available like actions. So um, what I want to show you today is three specific charts and the ones that I've listed here, state diagrams, sequence diagrams, and entity relationship diagrams, and how they can be used to help you diagram architecture. So let's start with the, the first, the state machine. So this is a really cool diagram, and its coolness is pretty subtle, right? A state machine describes basically the states that an entity can have and the list of available operations it could have in each state. So when you look at like the, um, hopefully you can see my mouse. I think you can. All right. So when you look at each one of these boxes, these boxes don't represent a different system or a different component. They represent the same entity, but they represent the entity in that current state. So if this was an ATM machine here, oh, first of all, in, in all notations systems, you'll typically see this. This means start, the little dot and the arrow. So that's the start of the chart or the start of the sequence. But in this case, the state diagram shows when you start, the 
the ATM is in the off state. And from the off state, it can only go to where the arrows point, right? So the only available state transition in this case is to turn on. And when it turns on, it enters the self-test state. And the self-test state has two available states that it can take. Um, although this diagram doesn't show it, the, um, yeah, Eddie, I will totally make them available. I'm going to put it on my blog too. Um, so uh, uh, he was asking about where I'm going to post the slides. I'm going to post the slides. I'll send a link to everybody on uh, on Slack, and I will also share it on my blog. Um, but anyway, in terms of like the state diagram, what you're seeing here is that like here's the state of the entity, and here's the available transitions um, in and out. Now, this is an incredibly powerful diagram. And the reason why it's incredibly powerful is that virtually every every row in the database that you put in or every table you design is effectively an entity and it probably has state, right? It probably has some non-trivial like status flag and, and it can go in and out of statuses and based on the status, it could have a set of operations. So when you're trying to explore that domain and you're like, well, what are the states this thing can be in? And what are the operations that can, you know, can be executed on it in the various states? Here's your diagram, right? This diagram tells you like, hey, there's a self-test state and the operations out of self-test are to go into idle or to failure. Um, and so that's like a, oops, sorry. So it's a great tool for basically exploring how your code's going to behave and, and the kinds of API calls you're going to enable in that, um, you know, or with that system or against that entity. Um, a great tool to use uh, to diagram state machines is called NomNomal. And this is a free tool. And um, I'm going to kind of break out of the, the uh, window here to kind of show you how neat this thing is. Uh, I just hid my slides. Oh, of course. All right. NomNomal is a... Um, it's a text-based uh, drawing tool. It draws boxes and lines. And so you can draw state diagrams pretty easily. So imagine we had the ATM state. We could literally like kind of reproduce what we were seeing there. So um, uses boxes to represent like uh, the state that like the state or the entity or whatever you want to use. But like let's imagine we have an ATM and its first state is uh, off, right? So we can do a box called off. And there might be a box called idle, as we saw. And then there was like error, um, you know, uh, processing user transaction. So you can define your states. And then with nomnormal, you can simply join them together by doing like kind of this little arrow syntax. So um, okay, start and start goes to idle. And then you'll see the, you know, the arrow will automatically be drawn to it. You can do diagramming with like a tool like OmniGraph or Visio or whatever. I tend to prefer the text only tools because um, it's easier to write text. You don't fiddle around with the, um, with the style so much, right? Um, and you can also do things like we have an architecture repo and we actually dynamically generate the diagram. So we check in the, uh, the DSL here and that will generate images and then we basically reference them in GitHub um, as like static images. So it, it'll actually generate the image, push to S3, and then we refer to them in well-known locations in S3. So that's kind of part of our process for uh, for using them and keeping them up to date. So anyway, that's nomnormal. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot to show you there. You can explore that on your own. Let me bring the presentation back. All right, um, the next really awesome diagram, this is my favorite diagram of all time, is called the sequence diagram. Sequence diagram describes interactions between systems and components in time order, right? So top down, top being the earliest interactions, bottom being the latest. And what's really cool about a sequence diagrams is you can have multiple service interactions, and that's what each one of these things represent. They represent like a lane of a service. Um, and you can have multiple service interactions. You can have conditional interactions. You can have like a bunch of stuff. And it's really helpful for kind of um, thinking through a larger coordinated process within like a microservice architecture. Um, and so 
this is a this is a UML standard. But fortunately, there are some easy tools for actually generating it. So I've tried to hand generate these in OmniGraffle, and it is a nightmare. I highly recommend you don't do that, right? But like I said, there are cool tools that will actually help you generate these things. So I'm going to show you the one we use a lot called uh, Web Sequence Diagrams. It is a it, it's got like a freemium and a commercial version. We use a commercial version because we diagram all the time. So this is an actual diagram that we have at work um, that describes how we register families in peach jar. Um, but I'm just going to create a new one and just kind of show you how it works. So um, generate a diagram. Let's imagine we're going to do that three tier architecture. So um, and let's let's do like a user registration form. So you can simply just uh, start by describing it with a title. So let's call this user registration. And then uh, the start of user res registration, let's say, is um, you're in your single page app and someone clicks a form and it's and it's sending the, the registration info to the server. So let's call it um, user UI or maybe call it registration UI. Registration UI will send a request to the, um, the web server. And we can give a little description. Register user. Now, pretty cool, right? Web server, in reaction to uh, the request, needs to contact the database and do some stuff, right? So let's uh, first say the web server is going to check to see if the user has already uh, registered. So he calls the DB and says, uh, check for user record. Okay. And then the DB, or, or yeah, the DB is going to call back and say, you know, web server, uh, no record. And then the web server is going to contact the DB again and say, create record. Sorry. And DB is going to be like, OK. And then the web server is going to return the results to the registration UI. Created. Yay. So that's a pretty simple interaction. Now, this interaction, according to the spec, is actually not accurate. Um, because what this kind of looks like right now is the registration UI sent a request to the web server and then just ignored, like just went off on its own merry way and like didn't do anything after it. Um, it, it may not look like that from the diagram, but when you see the, the swim lanes with, that you can add to this thing, you'll see it's actually kind of cool. So now, oh, that's not what I want. There you go. So now I added like this little box right here. And what this actually means is that registration UI is blocking until all of this stuff is done and then the response is coming back. And another thing you can do, and I like to do this, is show a little dotted line. This typically means async, but um, use the dotted line to represent more clearly, hey, the response is coming back. Like this is the end of the, the request. And you can do the same thing nested. So the web server, while it calls the DB for check user record, it could also have a little swim lane too. So we'll just add a little swim lane. And that's what these little plus icons, plus, minus. Now you see the DB was blocking. So this is pretty cool stuff. Plus, minus. Now we had a condition where possibly the uh, user record already existed, right? And we want to handle that. And so you can actually show that in a sequence diagram. So um, here we just denoted that there was no record. But what we're going to do is we're going to use an alt, which means alternate condition. And I can't remember if it's end alt or what. Yeah, it is end alt. OK. I think else. All right. And then with the alt, I can say um, the DB came back with no record. And if the DB came back with no record, or sorry, if the DB came back with a record, I'm going to say, uh, sorry, record found. It's typically good to put your uh, your error cases ahead of your success cases, particularly in the diagrams, because they have less sequences afterwards. Um, but anyway, I'll have the web server respond to the DB 
or it's not the DB, sorry, to the um, registration UI. And it says error, uh, user exists. Or, so here we have an error case, early termination. And then in the else case, we can say, you know, no record. Oops. No. And boom. So this is just one example of doing kind of, um, you know, conditional logic around your uh, your app and how you can kind of denote it in the diagram. And the beautiful thing is it's just text. So you don't have to like really um, invest a whole lot of time moving boxes and arrows around, right? Um, particularly if you get comfortable with the aesthetic that you've got provided uh, to you from the tool, um, you don't have to fret about it and you can be very productive in, in actually writing the diagrams. So like I said, I we use this a lot. I mean, look at all of our <laughs> diagrams, right? Um, and this is literally how we, um, we'll do this for any complex flow. We'll diagram basically the exact process in which something happens. Okay, so that's enough for uh, web sequence diagrams. Um, if you wanna explore more, I really encourage you going to uh, web sequence diagrams and just get a, a sense of it. Um, it's pretty easy to pick up. The um, last diagram I wanna show you tonight is the entity relationship diagram. And you've probably seen this if you went to college and did like a traditional comp sci background. Um, this is kind of one of those standard UML diagrams that your uh, your professor that teaches DBs will teach you. Um, this is just a way to represent data models and the relationships between models. Um, it's a formal UML specification, but you also have like variants that are independent. Um, and really just, it's so simple. Like it really just is, here is a class or a table and here are the properties under it. And if there's a connection between, you know, it and another entity, you'll have a line that goes out of that to the entity. And the little like little rake looking thing means it's a, a, a mini relationship and the single line coming out means it's a one. So employees has a one to many relationship with itself because, I don't know if I can zoom on this. Oh, my apologies. Okay, I guess I cannot zoom on it, but needless to say, it's a, it's a tool for um, visualizing uh, data models. And it's fairly helpful, um, but we'll get into kind of a more practical way of doing that. Finally, the last thing I want to point out, we talked about the C4 system, right? How it's a, you know, it's a collection of diagrams that you would use to diagram a task. And what I wanted to point out, which may not be obvious, is that it's actually a hierarchy of diagrams. When you're going to develop a system, you're doing a major line of work, you're probably going to have a bunch of these laid out in a hierarchy. So you're gonna have like your L1 system layout that is like, here is the world, this is how our system fits into it. And then you're gonna have maybe multiple level twos that say, here is a service layout for the bank IT system. Here's a service layout for the ATM branch system, right? And then you'll have your L3s, these are your component diagrams. So here is the, um, the component layout for the account processing system. But you might also have a sequence diagram, which is kind of a level three diagram, which will describe maybe the interaction between the accounting system and then the maybe the bank or branch system. And then finally, you'll have lower level diagrams that describe the models. So the accounting system might have an accounting model. So keep that in mind. The tools that you have describe what you want to build in layers. And each one of those layers, you kind of tackle it a specific level with a specific set of details, depending on what you want to try to describe. And you're describing the non-obvious complex stuff. You're not describing stuff that's very obvious. Okay, finally, recommendations. C4 in practice. So I, I just made a recommendation for C4, but what I want to actually emphasize is that not all the C4 levels are needed, depending on what you're trying to do, right? You're gonna trim it based on the audience. So. System context, really only good for people outside of your company who don't really understand the overall, like how the company fits in, like to the greater internet or uh, to, to businesses that you interact with or whatever. Um, so you may not want it. You might just chop it off, not use it. 
Container diagram. Container diagram is good for people who have some knowledge of the business, but maybe no internal understanding of the system. You're not going to want to keep describing the three tier like web architecture that you have, which is simply browser, web server, database. It doesn't need to be described because products might understand it. You know, the rest of the engineers in the company might understand it. So it's kind of a redundant diagram. Components, uh, the component diagrams, which talk about the individual components within a service or a system. This is probably where your developers are going to start at, right? They might get that, okay, we have all these services in, you know, in this layout, but now I need to know what they do and how they interoperate with other services. And finally, code. Code is typically a diagram only used within a team um, to coordinate efforts, right? Like if you are um, working with the front end and the front end and the back end need to come up with a, a contract or a model to describe what you're, you're building, you might create an ERD. Uh, finally, uh, your standard C4 charts aren't going to cut it. They're, they're static or like kind of layout views or like top-down views of the system. And you're going to want to supplement them with other charts. And the state diagram and the, uh, the sequence diagram are really good charts to include in your system. And then uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, you probably want to skip those L4 diagrams. So while I told you, hey, here's the ERD diagram, right? It describes the relationship between classes and tables. What I've come to is the idea that, honestly, code is almost always better than these diagrams, right? Yes, we could generate this beautiful little, like, you know, uh, table model with these relationships, or I could just bang out really quickly a bunch of interfaces in code. And they probably are more descriptive to the developers who actually need that than the actual diagram. Um, and finally, I, I think I said finally again. Oops, sorry. Finally, I guess my last recommendation, maybe this is my last, I got lost. Um, anyway, uh, you really want to do as little as possible. And I know this sounds crazy, right? As a guy who's presenting the diagram talk, but the reality is, these diagrams don't like maintain themselves, right? And so you, the, the diagram that you don't have to draw is the best diagram. And this is kind of preachy, but the way that you get to not drawing diagrams is by establishing architectural conventions, right? So if you do have a three-tier architecture, right? And every like API call is simply a REST call or GraphQL call that hits a controller and hits the database, there's no need to diagram. And having that convention is really powerful. Now, if you have to draw diagrams, it's best to have them generated from code. And this isn't the DSL tech stuff that I showed you with NomNormal and with web sequence diagrams. This is literally code. There are tools out there, um, like uh, you have the tracing charts that you can get in Jaeger. Uh, you have uh, diagrams that come from Datadog by watching service interactions. There are charts that can be automatically generated for your architecture that will help you describe it. And a lot of them kind of fall into the operational tools category, but those are great tools. So you don't have to maintain that classic system layout diagram. Finally, if you do have to actually manually create a diagram, do it from text, right? You'll get less control over the aesthetic, but they're just so much easier to maintain. And you don't like spend a lot of time bike shedding over style, right? Which is commonly what happens. Like I'll bike shed with myself and be like, hey, what's the appropriate color for that line? And when you don't have the, the freedom to choose that, you just become more productive. And then finally, if you have to do it, a manually created diagram with Visio or, or a napkin drawing or whatever, um, it's the most work, it's the worst to maintain, um, but it, I guess it's better than having nothing, um, particularly if people don't understand the system. And I keep clicking out of it. You know, I swear. I keep saying finally, but I have two more finalists. Uh, <laughs> another thing too to mention is that diagrams are a historical record of feature development, right? So um, I would advocate that you don't draw diagrams after you've written code. You use diagrams to communicate new features and you commit to not updating the diagrams after the code is written because you're wasting time by updating them. And I would only create new diagrams or modify the old ones if you're gonna add or you're going to do a new line of feature work, right? And, some, and stuff has dramatically changed. And you should really consider your system 
documentation as code, right? So the code that is in your code base, right, is your your documentation. So um, only document if you have to document only document uh, things that don't follow standard conventions, right? Like this one call doesn't do the three tier pattern. So we're gonna we're gonna document it because it's important. Um, use automated tools, like I said, the trace diagrams to model service relationships. And as much as possible, self-describing code, which is clear and concise and uses clean abstractions, is really easy to follow and is much preferable to a diagram. Conclusion. I'm sorry, it took so long. We talked about kind of the purpose of diagrams, like why you do it. Uh, I gave you an example of uh, six or seven diagrams specifically, but in a methodology that, that you can use to kind of document an entire system or major line of feature work. And I gave you some recommendations for using diagrams. Um, hopefully you got something out of this and uh, you're ready to jump in and start diagramming yourselves. So that's it for me. Do you have questions? Dude, that was so cool. My mind is like swimming right now. I, awesome. A bunch of questions and a lot of them you actually answered as you went through, but. Uh, totally. If you have questions, uh, if you're watching the stream, you have questions, put them in the um, in the comments section of the YouTube video and see them, and uh, I'll pass them on to Richard. Uh, I think you'll probably see them too. He, I think he monitors. Yes, them. I can see them. I don't know if there's any in Slack, but okay. Uh, I don't believe so. I looked in Slack yeah. as well. Okay, so I've, I've got a couple questions. Sure. Um, you you kind of mentioned that the state diagram, you love it, but what is your favorite diagram? Uh, sequence is the most practical for me, but... Okay. Um, state diagrams are incredibly important for really complex entities, right? So um, to maybe to give you an example, um, at PeachJar, we have, uh, we send flyers to parents, right? Um, but you can, you can schedule a flyer to go out, um, you know, multiple times throughout a year, right? So I can say, hey, I want to send this flyer three times. So we have to manage the life cycle of a flyer. You know, what, you know, is it pending release? Has it been released? Is it canceled? Has it been paid? There's a lot of pieces to it. And depending on what those pieces are, right? Like that's what can happen with a flyer, right? Like you can't, you can't send a flyer that has been canceled. And so a state diagram is great at establishing first those states. Like here is the range of states that this thing can be in. And then based on the arrows that go in and out of it, the valid transitions. And so I literally have code that looks like an array of an arrays. And it says, the thing is in this state, and these are the valid transitionable states, right? If you try to execute a piece of, you know, a, a, like an action that transitions it, and it's not in one of those transitionable states, it's an error. And so, yeah, so the uh, state diagram is really good for complex stuff, I guess. So on that, you mentioned that um, you don't typically keep them up to date. Or yes. You don't, um... So how, how is that still useful? I, I guess uh, my brain isn't, isn't grasping the fact that they can still be useful. Are, well, are they still useful past the initial development? Uh, first of all? Okay, so that's a great question. And what I want to point everybody to, uh, oh, Eddie's asking, is there any chance we can increase the volume? Yeah, reach over to mine. Oh, am I talking too loud? I'm sorry, Eddie. <laughs> I think I'm talking too quiet. Uh, you sound good to me. I can't hear myself, so I'm sorry if that's too low. Uh, here, I'm going to turn mine volume up. Eddie, just let me know if that if this is better. Okay. All right, so go ahead. Um, yeah. If you will. So there is actually kind of this school of thought, and uh, it was developed. It's been developed over the last couple of years um, around the idea that your architectural documentation represents kind of a point in time of your decision making. And this is highlighted by a framework or kind of a methodology called architectural decision records or lightweight architectural decision records. And literally a lightweight archi architectural decision record um, could literally just be a markdown document that said, this is the problem we're trying to solve. This was our research in it, uh, like around this problem. And this was our approach and why we took it. And they will literally create these, like a repo full of these ADRs. And the ADRs will be basically organized by like timestamp, right? Like we created this in September, you know, of 2020. And if you are coming to the system and you don't have the context or the knowledge of why things are done, you read the ADRs top to bottom and you go through kind of the evolution of the framework. And so it's a, 
it's an understanding that the it's really difficult and time consuming to keep documentation up to date. And oftentimes what's really important are the pivotal decision points on why you did something and not the kind of like little minutiae, like the little features that you added. And so you can kind of like orient yourself off the ADRs and then drill deep into the code to get a better idea is kind of the thought. And that's preferable to the time spent keeping stuff maintained. So one of the th one of the things that was um, in my mind as you're going through some of these things was this these could be great for onboarding devs, but then you got to the point where you're not keeping up to date, and yeah. so then I was like, well, would it be great for onboarding new devs? I mean, you could go through why at the beginning you chose to do something or what it looked like at the beginning, um, but do you see potential value in trying to keep them up to date um, with major features? I guess uh, to provide those to new devs on the team. Yeah, so if you're going to do, so I, what I would say is if you're going to do a major feature and you're going to change a system of record, right? Like here's a system in our, you know, our uh, environment and we're going to, to refactor it so that it does something different. At that point, it may make sense to make changes to the original diagrams. But what I would do is append only. I would basically copy it and be like, in the new ADR, here's the new version of the system, right? Like ignore all previous versions. Um, it is true that this is not optimized for the new the new person onboarding right like the process is but i think the um i think what people really would uh prefer is automated tools to give you kind of the the knowledge of the system as it is today mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of great tools that will show you like like flow diagrams out of services and stuff like that like there are like literally built-in tools into like Istio and stuff like that to show you kind of the service layouts. Um, and then like uh, clear and concise code, in my opinion, is a much better roadmap of what's actually happening in a system, right? And it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of experience to actually get there. And a lot of people never do. So take it for a grain of salt. If you want to like, you know, over document because you know your team can't reach that, then that's fine. Right. Yeah. Engineering okay. trade-offs. So, yeah, we we had a new dev join our team, and uh, she's totally hit the ground running. She's very, I've, I've been very impressed. But um, part of me is like sad that it's going to take her so long to understand all the little minutia. Um, and then I was like, well, what? We'll just make a chart. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah. But then, so then, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's the answer. But, um, but that's where my mind went after after watching some of these things. Um, so just so everyone knows, and me included, where are you spending most of your time in terms of the levels? Like, what is your day-to-day -day job? So when I architect, most of the time it's level two diagrams, right? Okay. So it's component diagrams. And I can actually, let me uh, kind of, I'll just show you some because they're not really sensitive. Sure. Um, uh, we're, we're like in the middle of replatforming right now. Um, so we have this old legacy system and we are trying to, modernize into a new microsystem or microservices based system. And so I have like, I actually check in my, uh, I use OmniGraffle when I have to do like uh, a lot of diagrams. Um, and so I'll check in my, my Graffle files in, but like, here's actually literally something I'm working on right now. And this actually, the, the intended audience of this chart was me, was no one else. Right? Um, but like we have a scheduler and um, this is a this is a component diagram. Um, you can see that it has a little bleed over a level two, right? So these are these are containers. Like here's Kafka, here's our subscriptions microservice and our flyer scheduler microservice. Um, but what I actually have here is I have these are queues, right? So these are queues. They're consumed by like a, a subscriber, and then there's some action create like taken, right? Um, for instance, like whenever we have a kind of distributed cron event that comes in and we need to release flyers for a particular audience, um, that will get received by the flyer scheduler. It'll get processed. And then that process literally will uh, publish new events, which end up into another queue. So um, yeah, a lot of, I would say a lot of your work will be level two, level three component, component and container diagrams. And I would really kind of avoid code diagrams as much as possible, yeah. just because code is so cheap nowadays. Yeah. And not only is it cheap, 
let me show one more thing. A lot of your oh wait, wrong wrong thing. <laughs> a a so lot you're of already your, in on the grapple. Yeah, a lot of your tools will auto generate code diagrams, which is kind of cool. So, give me a second. I gotta boot up a, a database real fast. Um, guys are looking under the skirt a little bit here. <laughs> this is what we want to see. Show us the the nitty gritty. Yeah, the day to day. Uh, All right, well, while that's loading up, um, yeah. again, if, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the comments. Um, I've still got a few more that I'd love to ask him if, if Richard doesn't mind him. Um, and then afterwards, we'll be on Slack uh, after we're done with the, the actual video portion, the, the stream. Um, and we'll both be on there. We can answer questions uh, if you have any. Um, I see that there are already some people in there giving some comments, which is great. So uh, thanks for joining in. Okay, so uh, like I said, I try to shy, like I try to get people to not do a lot of code diagrams, and the reason why is so this is Data Grip. I'm a big fan of the IntelliJ product line. Like I have the uh, monthly subscription, and I get basically all the all the tools that they offer, um, and their tools are really great. And one of them is this database client called Data Grip, um, and it's multi database. So like here, you'll see I have like Postgres instances. Uh, MySQL. Some of these are, um, you know, Aurora instances. But anyway, um, what's really cool with OmniGraffle, or not OmniGraffle, uh, with uh, Data Grip. Data Grip. It, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you can uh, you can generate uh, diagrams. So I can say, all right, uh, database tool. All right, maybe it's not there. Hold on one second. Of course, it takes me longer to figure it out. <laughs> when I'm like, oh, right here, Di it's under the thing called diagram. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, this tool is basically going to look at my schema and generate an ERP mm -hmm. based on my database. Nice. So, may not be necessary given the fact that like you have the actual SQL. Um, sure. But if if you want that visual aspect of it, boom, generated. No one's got to go around and and update that whenever you add new yeah. properties. Stop. Yeah, that's true. So obviously, like these things take time to generate, um, and that's time when you could be developing. Um, so I guess, where do you find that spending the time on the front end saves on the back end? Is this is this when you're trying to? I guess it depends on the audience. But are you trying to convince shareholders, or are you trying to sell an idea to your team, or you're trying to get your team to implement something that you've designed? Where yep. are the most time saved? Uh, so I would honestly say. Okay, if I had to pick one, because I was going to say all of the above, but uh, <laughs> if, I, if I was going to pick one, probably the um, if you're a lead or you, you're aspiring to be a lead, the hardest thing to do is communicate your vision to your teammates, right? Yeah. Um, or even if you're not a lead, if, if you've just taken over uh, ownership of you know a section of the system and you want to describe how it's implemented, think about how you would do that, right? Like, how do I get Geo to understand my vision for something? And a lot of times it's, it's incredibly hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of my time goes into producing these diagrams so that I can, like, walk people through them and be like, this is kind of the vision of what we're trying to do. Here's literally in detail exactly how, like, these service interactions are supposed to occur. Or here's the general model that we're thinking. And, like, that, what that does is it imparts the vision onto those developers and it gives them the kind of the core idea of like, you know, this is what we're trying to do and it lets them run with it, right? From that point on, they get to be creative within that context. And that's valuable because that's delegating, right? Share the vision, but let them go off and do what they need to do as long as they know the goals. And so if you are the one that has all the knowledge of the system and you can't impart it to people, then you're the, you're the, roadblock in the whole you know in the roadmap of the product or whatever yeah. so that's primarily it um but like i said there there are advantages to conceptualizing the model for yourself too sure let me ask this from the opposite direction so mm -hmm. i know from some comments we received and some feedback that we have a good number of junior devs that um, mm -hmm. watch these talks and attend the meetups when we actually have them in person um if some, if a junior dev came to you and, and mocked something up like an idea or even an existing system in some one of these charts, would, would you be 
impressed with that? Or would you be like, man, you're out of your element? Um, like how, what would your response be as a lead dev? I would be so stoked. <laughs> I would be, I would be incredibly stoked. First of all, <laughs> like a tear. nothing is out of your, nothing is out of your, uh, you know, your element or I, I don't know what the issue was that you use, but, but like you need to be growing and you're not going to grow unless you don't take risks and take on greater responsibility. And for, like, usually as a, as a dev, your growth path is towards a lead, right? That's your initial, like your next step into, you know, uh, I guess career development. And as a lead, you've got to, like I said, you've got to communicate what's going on, why you're doing things, right? And that is the way to do it. You know, honestly, when I have junior developers that are going to take on a, you know, set of responsibilities, I will ask them, give me a napkin diagram, right? Mm -hmm. Show me what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I would say the number one problem that I have with junior developers is that they are impulsive. Hmm. They sit down and they write code without thinking about it. And, you know, if you think that, like, we senior developers don't do it, like, if we, we don't sit down and think about what we're going to write before we write it, you're crazy. I yeah. literally, like, <laughs> have comments with, like, numbers that I say, first thing we're going to do is we're going to call the database and we're going to find out if this record exists. Second, and I write this down in a sequence, and then what I do is I implement and, like, backfill my comments. Mm. And, like, literally, I can pull up code that I wrote today that I did that. Because we're not great at grokking the system all the time, right? Like, we can't have, like you know, omniscient knowledge of what's going on. And yeah. so we have to like, we have to give ourselves roadmaps. And so like I said, diagramming is a roadmap for junior engineers to like, kind of like help yourself orient what tasks you're going to do. So one thing you said there made me wonder, do you actually build these diagram kind of like a um, test driven development where you write a test, make it, you know, make it fail, then write the code to make, make it green. Do you actually do that with, um, diagrams like this like you draw the diagram and then you you code to the diagram one yes. at a time yes i do actually let me show you um and uh aj yes pair programming is essential you're going to learn more Agreed. in a pair programming session than you you ever will on your own yep. right i learn every day from my i learn from uh people that work under me every day like there are you're not going to be a master of everything um but anyway yes i absolutely do and actually just to kind of show you, I don't know if my screen's still shared. I can get it back up. Uh, I have the power. Awesome. All right. Uh, it's actually on GitHub. Sorry. Uh, yeah, while you're bringing that up, Eddie has a question. He says, as a fresher, would you suggest I spend time building diagrams or just get to an intermediate level of understanding how to read them? Uh, well, actually, I would say learn, build a diagram because you know what? In the process of building the diagram, you're going to learn how to read them. Yeah. So, without knowing how to build these diagrams, that's that would have been my answer too, because that's typically the the answer when you're talking about learning something, um, or getting an understanding of something. You know, go if you want to know how to build a Rails app, go you know start a Rails app and start tinkering around and see what stuff does and go through a um, a tutorial. Uh, that's typically play. In my opinion, playing is the best way to learn. Um, just come up with an idea like how would you want. How would you want that ATM to work if you were designing it? And then, you know, build up your own ATM diagram, the state state diagram. Yep. Absolutely. All right, what you got for us? What is yeah, this? yeah. So so this is what I was going to show you. So um, I'm actually going to show you, like, a line of work that we were developing and kind of the charts that we built before we actually gave this work to a team and said, all right, now you're executing on this, right? So um, let me see. I might not be in this the right location here. No, this isn't right. Sorry. Um, so one thing to note is this is our architecture repo. This is a GitHub repo of our architecture. Mm. Right? Like we literally store all the stuff, and we actually have. Part, actually, I should show as a part of our CI pipeline. Dude, I'm so scared. You okay. browsing this code? <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's, Please don't put problem. anything out that would compromise your system. No, we're not. We're very we're, we're good about that. We don't. Okay, good. Repo. But anyway, what I want to show is we actually have CI pipelines that build our charts, mm -hmm. right? So um, like this is our docs task, right, for building our docs. And it actually pushes our, our built images to S3, and then we reference those in the actual uh, GitHub markdown. Hmm. So um, 
Anyway, if I come here, I think it was under Knowledge Graph. By the way, this was a completely failed line of work. This didn't work out for us, and we had to modify. So I just want to point out that like you're not always going to succeed, even when you sure. have a lot of experience. But um, phase one of my uh, phase one of this line of work was basically detailed, um, like in Markdown, and it was given to a team um, and what you'll see is that like we have kind of like the goals, like here are the goals, here are the Jira tasks that you're trying to like in the stories that you're trying to implement. Here are the containers, the related containers in our system. Here is a diagram. This is our container diagram, right? Of kind of how we view the process, the components, right? So here you'll see that we, we sometimes actually drop into code to like, <laughs> like pseudo code to, to document things. Um, but yeah, we'll put shared code. Like this is what the model we think should look like. And Jeez, then look at that. we put our sequence diagram. So you'll see sequence diagrams for us for every major uh, like API call. So mm -hmm. this is get district info, right? So we deal with schools and districts. So this is a call for getting district information. And you'll see that we have, you know, this was only like uh, three API calls, three stories that we're trying to um, write. And yeah. So on that get schools by district, um, mm -hmm. go back just a little yeah. bit down further. Um, hold on one second. I think I'm starting to clip a little bit. My get schools by district. Audio. I'm sorry. I'm having some audio issues. I, I, okay. There's no way to test my audio levels in this yeah. app. Uh, okay. So get schools by district. That looks kind of straightforward. So yeah. on something like that is, do you still feel like the time spent to create that is worth it? Yeah. You know, honestly, if it wasn't so simple and I wasn't copying and pasting, uh, like text, I probably wouldn't have. Um, another thing too, is remember like for us, this is remember your audience as well. True. The team that I was giving this project to wasn't particularly well versed with Amazon Neptune and the stack that we were going to use. And so I wanted to be very clear on how they were and where they were getting this data. So that's kind of like another piece. What you actually don't, you may not be seeing because it's a little like um, hard to see here, is that uh, Amazon Neptune is a graph database. And so the language that we're using to query the graph is Gremlin, right? So this was Gremlin. Um, and so this team had no prior knowledge of Amazon Neptune or Gremlin. So literally, as the architect, I had to go out and be like, all right, how do I execute this call in Gremlin so that I can like say, here's your main query <laughs> that you, mm -hmm. you're going to execute. You need to build a scaffolding around it. Um, yeah, so exactly. You, you, hmm. You're you writing documentation for the audience. You're trying to give them what they need to succeed. And that might be a redundant diagram, like you pointed out. Convention would say this is simplistic and it shouldn't be uh, a diagram. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. All right. We got another um, question mm -hmm. from Eddie here. It says, sure. um, I'm looking for my first opportunity in development and I want to manage my time wisely when it comes to practice and learning. If you were to hire a new dev, would you want them to be able to build diagrams hitting the ground running? I do not expect a new dev to be diagramming. Um, I, you know, a lot of mid levels aren't diagramming either. Yeah. Um, if you're, interested in diagramming is not going to hurt you certainly not going to hurt you um so yeah i i honestly think that um and what i would recommend to uh engineers that are uh, okay <laughs> it's philosophical here or philosophical here but for junior devs what i would recommend is l l like really focus on knowing how to code right um and not just knowing how to code understanding the well-defined software development processes, right? Like getting a better understanding of agile development, like, cause that's kind of the most common like methodology used. Um, understanding your, uh, one thing that I think a lot of people don't know well enough is their source control, mm -hmm. right? Learning source control really well. Like I still see people with the, the, uh, the GitHub app open, right? And I'm like, command line's way easier, right? And if you have to like recover something, that's where you wanna be. Um, so like, there are a lot of things to learn as a junior developer. I would say, focus on those pieces, 
And then maybe as you start to get into the mid levels, maybe that's where you really want to go into architecture and stuff like that. Yeah. But along those lines, I would say that, um, in my opinion, it would be important to be able to read code, um, and read diagrams, uh, make, I would make that your priority as you're trying to get in, um, as a junior dev, uh, that way you can give feedback on, um, other devs code. You can learn how things work. You can, you know, honestly, every team has their own style of code too. So you can, um, see how, uh, your style would fit in with theirs and and vice versa. Um, so that's how I would answer that. I, I would also just want to add one thing. Reading code yeah, is incredibly important. Read quality code first, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I swear to you, because my first job as a professional software engineer, I was given this code base. And first job, didn't really know anything, had the imposter syndrome going. Mm-hmm. I looked at the code and like I went home and I told my wife, I, I think I'm going to get fired because <laughs> I don't understand this, right? I I was like, I'm something's not clicking. And then after like a little while being there, I just realized it was terrible code. It was mm. the worst code I had ever seen. And it wasn't me that was the problem. It was the code. So yeah. read code, but go to like one of these really good, like go to the React code base. Yeah. Go to where you see these really like incredibly talented software engineers writing code. Don't go to someone's like weird unsupported library on GitHub with like one star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four, four stars yeah. or less. Yeah. And definitely don't go to my code bases. <laughs> <laughs> All right, AJ says, should diagramming be a full team kind of thing, bringing in product managers, QA, and other project stakeholders? So maybe. All right. So there is a there's a um, a really cool topic called event storming, and it's a it's part of the domain driven design kind of family of concepts or methodologies. That is a full team kind of like uh, discovery methodology. I don't think that a product person is going to get a lot out of a sequence diagram, just to yeah. be honest. Um, so, like, it, it once again, it's, it's knowing your audience. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I like for for product, we tend to leave off on the mocks, right? The mocks are our contract between boundaries, and the one thing that we've really learned repeatedly because we keep thinking that we're smarter than we really are. Um, the one thing we've learned is wait for the mocks, don't develop anything until you get them. Because what you're gonna find is that the way the product like designs things, it will completely change your model. Yeah. So um, so yeah, uh, mocks are really like kind of that, that boundary layer between product and, and engineering. And honestly, you gotta think about this in terms of everybody's time is money in the company and it's probably not worth product's time to be trying to understand low level technical stuff. Yeah. That's all I would say. Yeah. They don't need to know how the database is put together. Yeah. I mean, they might be interested and sure if they want to know, absolutely tell them, give them. Yeah. Like, there might be some nerds on the product team. Yeah. That's not Nerd a problem with them, but I would just, yeah, definitely don't treat it as a castle, right? Like this is yeah, a yeah, yeah. fortification, but like, yeah, you want to save them the, yeah, the time. So. Uh, I have one last question. Um, and again, if anybody else is that's watching has any questions, let us know. Um, for the two tools you showed, which was nomnoml.com and websequencediagrams.com, do those have their own kind of languages or are those text-based uh, development or tools widely supported? Um, they are their own uh, specific languages. Okay. Um, they're really easy to pick up, but there are there are more standard ones. Um, like I think there's like text UML, and there's a couple of other diagramming frameworks that are text based. Um, I'm not super familiar with them, partly because a lot of them cost money, and yeah. um, I if I can't get the the uh, the license for the entire team, I don't use the tool. Um, and the only thing that's not true for is OmniGraphle because yeah. it is like the superior product on Mac, but it's 300 a year, $300 a year. So another thing too is learn to write off your software tools in your taxes. Honestly, you like, yeah. Yeah, that's what I do. Um, but yeah, I, I generally stick with tools that are free or accessible to everybody. So Yeah, that's cool. I know that there's probably some people out there that are hesitant to jump into a, a, a tool and learning, um, 
a type of a text DSL if it's not yeah. supported, if, you know, non mammal goes under or websequencediagrams.com yeah. gets bought out and changed and, you know. Which is totally fair, but to be yeah. honest, you guys are learning new web frameworks every two years. I mean, <laughs> the cognitive load of that text, the cognitive load of web sequence diagrams, I think I learned it in like 10 minutes, right? So yeah, I don't yeah. think you're going to be, you're not really wasting your time learning it. And another thing too is um, web sequence diagrams actually has little like like uh, snippets that you can cut. So it'll be like, here's a parallel mm. block and you press it and it inserts it into the diagram. So nice. you'll learn by doing really quick. So yeah. All right, well, Tim has some dots. I don't know if that was something that didn't come through on YouTube or not, but uh, Tim, if, if you're out there and that was a, an actual question, uh, try again, because it, it didn't come through quite quite well enough for me to understand at least. Um, so uh, before we wrap up, just you do have two devs here that are willing to answer questions. I know we're like an hour and 15 minutes, it's 8.15, um, so we can wrap up. Um, but if you have any other questions about diagrams or anything else, please let us know. Um, let me put up the address for our Slack again. So um, if you do want to join us on our Slack, uh, we'll be in there afterwards and during the month after this, um, leading up to our next uh, meetup for next month. Um, but jump in there, uh, chat with us. It's pretty low volume at the moment. Um, we just opened this up last month. So uh, we only have about, I guess, 20 people in there right now. Uh, but but join us. And um, this started as a um, community around... Um, Southern California, Carlsbad, San Diego areas. And uh, for now, I don't honestly know who's watching. You could be watching from um, England or uh, I guess it'd be real late for you in England, or you could be watching from next door. I just, I have no idea. Um, but if you want to join the Slack, that's fine. We're, we're here to help. We want to be a resource to everyone. Um, but just know that a lot of times our, uh, we're, we are focused on um, working for people in uh in Southern California. So with that being said, for people who are watching, who may have um, Southern California roots or um, are, are here now and you're hiring, if you, if your company is hiring right now, please let us know. Um, if you're looking for a job, please let us know. There's um, a job board Slack uh, channel on the Slack group. So feel free to post anything in there if you're looking or if you're offering. I know that planning center, the company I'm working for, I know that we're going to be hiring here pretty soon. Um, and I think a few of those, um, if I remember correctly, are going to be junior dev positions. Um, so I know people are always looking to get in the door. This could be a way to do that. Um, and we are hiring for Ruby and Rails and JavaScript React uh, devs. Um, let me bring Richard back in here. Boo, Richard. He did, the thing with the thing is like he doesn't even know I want to bring him in. Um, so boo, I, we've got another fan. Here's here's Tim. He brought something up. He says Tim. Says you're not a fan of updating diagrams after project completion. How do you bring new team members up to speed with obsolete diagrams? So that's what I was kind of asking earlier about the onboarding. Maybe you can touch that on that again. Yeah, totally. So um, let me first ask you this: Do you have diagrams that you maintain to bring like people on, like up to date on your current architecture? Asking me or are you asking Tim? I'm just saying Tim or anybody because okay. I just throw that out because I think a lot of companies don't. In fact, the one thing that we are really terrible at as an industry is onboarding new employees. Yes. So, um, so yeah, it's a criticism. And I actually admit that this strategy is not optimal for that particular purpose. But what you have to do is you have to hedge kind of like your strategy, right? So we know that we're not great at updating documents. Um, so what we have done is we've intentionally, and this is really important, we've intentionally said we're not going to do it. And that way we make a commitment to the fact that we're, we aren't. Um, and that we're going to treat our documents as like a point in time, kind of like snapshot of our architecture. So at this point in September of last year, this is what we were, the major feature we were working on. And this is kind of the layout of the system. And this kind of follows, and I, I posted this on the general chat of, uh, of Slack. This follows kind of the lightweight ADR model. Um, and this is like the ThoughtWorks blog post on it. Um, it's just like an, a log of like, these are the decisions that we made and why we did them. Okay, now for us, when we onboard people, our strategy um, for getting them to understand the system is that we use ops tooling to help kind of give them an idea of like all the services that we have. 
we we're a small team, so we have to like rely on automation and and convention, which is really powerful. So, um, in fact, can you, can I share my screen again? Absolutely. So I'm going to show you some hacks that we do. Okay. Like I said, we're not a big team, but when you go to our GitHub page, all right, and this is internal, nothing sensitive here. Honestly, we send flyers to families, right? Like it's not like <laughs> the, the Pentagon here, right? Um, but anyway, we, we rely on conventions. So first of all, um, our our repository naming is very intentional, right? So um, depending on what the deployment pro profile is, we will... Um, you know, we will use different conventions for like its name. So service SVC means not like just a service, but actually a specific type of technology and setup for our deployment, right? So when you want to know what are all the services in our system, mm -hmm. like you can kind of like filter it and you can see like kind of all of our stuff, right? Um, we're a microservice architecture. So these are different microservices. Another thing too is we create starter kits. So like every like repository that like if we're like, hey, go off and create a new microservice, right? They're not on their own to copy and paste stuff. Um, we actually have like like a starter repo, like or like a template repo, which basically oh, yeah. is something where you can come into it and you can say, use this template to create your own repo. And then we even do other stuff like um, we actually use uh, uh, Gomplet, which is a Go uh, framework, Go templating framework, and we template our um, our services. So, like in package JSON, you'll see that there's actually like placeholders. And so, like when you want to bootstrap a repo, we actually have like a customization script where you check, you clone the repo, you run the customization script, and then basically it deletes all the extra scaffolding, and you have effectively a deployable service. Nice. Right. So we do a lot of these things to kind of cheat. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have to manage repos in bulk. Um, another thing to also add is um, for our standard services. Right. Um, these are the ones that like a typical request we wouldn't document. Um, we have code like code conventions and structures that kind of um, are they're used throughout all of our projects. Right. So our API folder, that's where all the models are. Commands, events, queries. These are like, so commands and queries are the API calls that you can make. So you can add a distribution, cancel a distribution. Uh, so these are our different like um, API requests. These are our API mutated requests and queries are our non-mutated requests. And then um, the service will publish events that can be listened to um, on Kafka by other services. And these are the things that they, they can listen to, right? Um, and so by having the strategy where all of our services are kind of organized like this, once you understand the structure of one service, you understand the structure of all the services. And our deployment for the same way, our CI systems the same way. So yeah. That almost that kind of goes back to that pyramid you had earlier of being lazy. Um, and this is, I think, a good example of being kind of lazy in that you don't have to think about, well, how do I start up and how do I create a new service? What are all the little things? What are all the little files I need to, to include? And how do I you know, generate that package JSON file? Um, so this is a good way to be lazy. I, I, like, I like that. Yeah. And, and Tim, your, your comments fair, right? Original authors will leave a project um, and will, you know, institutional memory can get lost. But the thing is every developer in our system understands like or every developer in our company understands the system and so like because they understand it we haven't really lost institutional memory and the things that are really complicated the things that don't fit this typical like api call pattern that's where our sequence diagrams are and so for us generally once we implement an api um there's not really like a whole lot of changes that occur um or if they occur we're um you know, we're, we're there to basically update or create new documentation um, to accommodate that. Yeah. So Eddie, uh, yeah. yeah, Eddie says, it sounds like the methodology is more effective for existing devs than brand new devs. Yeah, that's fair. You know what? Yeah. It's, we're optimized. We're a small team, so we're optimized for the people we have. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, like most of the time, you're going to have existing devs. Most of your time, <laughs> you'll, have, you'll rarely have a new dev. 
Yeah. And that's unfortunately why onboarding is such an issue is because the time is just isn't spent on it because we don't, it's not something that happens all the time. Yeah. So, so I've been with Peachair for three years and our, um, our initial onboarding when we came to the company was like really long. Like it was awful. No one knew what the hell was going on. Right. <laughs> um, and progressively we have cut that back. I would say to onboard a mid-level developer, it takes about a month for us. Mm. Um, which I think is actually pretty good. Yeah. That's a month to like basically cut ties in that person to really know what they're doing and to like, they may not know like the whole model of the whole system, but they now know how our services work and interoperate and they can basically do the reverse engineering and go through yeah. and be like, well, I know that this model belongs over here and the API structure is always the same across all services. And yeah. There's a point where you know enough that you can then teach yourself and find the answers. Yeah. So there's there's that whole you don't know what you don't know, um, yeah. and then you know you can't do anything with that. But then finally, at some point, you do know what you don't know. You know enough that you know what you don't know, and then you gain enough knowledge that you can start yeah. to to answer those questions on your own. Yeah, yeah, and and there's another thing to add to is there's an opp opportunity cost for uh, like creating the onboarding process and all that. And one of the things that we've really focused on is we know that like we could spend time documenting everything, but honestly, it's maybe easier for us to pair you with a new with an existing developer and have you work with them, um, because I, I cannot tell you how fast your documentation will go stale. It's going to go stale way faster than you think it can. And for companies that like do, that's not true. I would almost argue that that might be because their development is slow, right? Like they have a much slower pace of development. Yeah. I will say that there are more tools uh, for documentation that actually have tests within the documentation itself. So I know like Elixir, okay. they have doc tests. And so yeah. you can write the documentation and show examples. And when you run your test suite, it actually runs those examples from your documentation yeah. just to make sure that your documentation examples at least aren't getting stale, which I love. That's beautiful. And I think that there's other... Languages are starting to do that as well. Yeah, and and the beautiful part about that is the test, right? Yeah. Like when you're small, <laughs> yeah. team, the unit tests are absolutely critical. They for us, we're we're somewhat pseudo continuous deployment. Where and I say pseudo because we tag a repo, even though we could like auto deploy a repo if it passed integration tests. Um, that's more of like a, a safety mechanism because we're not super confident yet. Yep. But, um, like my, I'll give you an example. Our CTO decided he wanted to start contributing features because he's bored during the pandemic. <laughs> and he's like, um, I made all these changes. Uh, like, should I stage them in a branch or something? I'm like, no, commit them to master. And he goes, but what if it breaks something? And I said, well, if it breaks something, it won't get deployed. So it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. And like you go through and you fix the tests and yeah, you redeploy. So yeah, safety rails. yeah, safety rails and and cheating, cheat as much as you can. If you can, <laughs> you're trying to squeeze out as much like developer productivity as you can. I don't care if people like have told you that's a bad idea. If you think it's going to work and it's going to save you like time in the long run, cheat, do it. Right. Yeah. Yep. So. Yep. I agree with that. All right. We're, we're just at about an hour and a half. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, there might be more questions, but again, put them in Slack, uh, join our Slack community. Um, we'll be there. It may not be tonight, but we'll certainly answer your questions um, before uh, too long. So, and there's other people in there that can answer your questions as well. Um, if you have any uh, ideas for topics or if you want to give a talk, please let us know. Um, I do know that uh, when I sent out a survey asking people if they thought that these virtual things were a good idea in the first place, that was before last month, um, I did hear a lot of good responses that, yes, please do them. Um, nice thing about uh, full stack as we do broadcast them live even when we're doing them in person you can watch it live from anywhere and they're archived as well so you can come back and watch richard's talk you know 100 times if you wanted to you could fall asleep with his dulcet voice in your ear um learning about <laughs> diagrams um but if you have any other suggestions please let us know um there's a, a feedback form uh, that i've put on the bottom of the screen there for a little bit fill that out let us know how we're doing let us know uh, how we can help you um, and cause we really would, we'd like to be a resource. Um, with that said, um, next month we don't have a topic yet, but I think we're going to do code wars, which one's better, Vim, Emacs, VS code. No, I'm just kidding. We're not gonna do that. Um, but 
I was wondering if um, something like a round table would work. This, this technology that I'm using now um, that uh, is, you know, I've got Richard on here. I've got me on here. Um, it's kind of cool. I kind of want to test the limits of this thing. So um, I may see if we can get like, you know, four or five, you know, seven people on here um, to answer, just have a Q and a, and maybe I'll moderate and have some questions built up in the first place. Um, so let us know what you think about that idea, uh, whether it's in the YouTube comments or on the Slack comments, either one. Um, but that's kind of, as I've been going through this, I was like, this is kind of fun. Just having the, the live questions come in and Richard and I kind of riffing up each other and answering these questions as they, as they come in. So hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Um, that being said, thank you so much, Richard. Um, I, I told you I, I, my, my mind was, was swimming with ideas. Um, and, uh, I was looking forward to this talk coming in and, uh, and it delivered. So I appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'm Gio. Uh, again, I appreciate you guys joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.